couple of weeks ago at the last dojo that they're using samples. I was like, hey, that's good. So we should get something here. That's uh, a good endorsement for what we're doing as well. Yeah. Uh, are you good too? Yeah, yeah. Good. Let me good. give you the hand. So, let me start. Yeah, cool. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, since I'm the first in the series of talks and it's the morning, I probably should dance for about two minutes and get your attention. <laughs> Maybe not everybody's awake. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, so yeah, what I want to talk to you about today is continuous delivery and how we're using it at ITV, how we're using um, RPM packaging and CentOS and how that's helping us. Um, if anybody's not familiar with continuous delivery, which I think it's not the case in this circle, um, by the end of the talk you should have a good idea of what it is about. Right, so that's me. That's my name, work at ITV, Linux engineer. You have all those details. So, a little bit of background about ITV. And, um, so, for historic reasons, we kind of had to go, we're forced to go with Red Hat 5. Um, historic and political reasons, I won't go into that that much. Um, but we're moving swiftly to CentOS. The gist of it is that we're an RPM-powered shop, so that's all you need to know. Um, this is a bit about the agenda, what we've been talking about today, um, in terms of continuous delivery and a few things uh, I've been trying to adopt at ITV. Right, so let's start with um, a little bit of background on continuous delivery. So. I'm sure you'll find a lot of uh, definitions online for continuous delivery. I'll just uh, Google it and you'll find a lot of things. But basically what it does, it helps you with a few things. Uh, in terms of delivering an application, it gives you um, a, a reduced feedback loop. So when someone makes some sort of mistake and introduces a bug, you can easily spot it before going to a production-like system. Um, and it keeps your working uh, application, it keeps your application in a working state from the beginning. So you introduce just small increments in the application instead of just trying to deliver the whole big bang approach. Um, and a few best practices around it. Um, just keep all software in a source code management. Um, that includes application software as well as software used for configuration management because everything is software just put it in a config management in a source code management um, some of these practices are well tested by other people it's not, not inventing anything new building binaries once and right might as well just start getting to it so before we talk about the continuous delivery, you, we need a bedrock for continuous delivery, and that's you working with infrastructure as code, working with the config management, making sure that you describe your infrastructure in code and you make sure that you can deliver it as you're delivering the application, following those cycles. Um, so at ITV, we use Puppet. I mean, there are a number of other good tools that you can use. We just started with Puppet. We have the best experience in Puppet, so we'll just continue with Puppet for now. Um, why would you use uh, uh, configuration management? Well, it allows you to f do a few things. Uh, it allows you to spring up reproducible environments, so once you've got everything coded for an environment, all your dependencies, you can easily spin up another environment. That's really easy to do. Um, it gets you to a point where someone can introduce a change, one of your teammates in, in your sysadmin team can introduce a change, and you can follow it through environments, you can spot it, you can, if it's an error, you can, you know who to talk to to go and sit down and fix that error, that problem. Um, and that's where traceability and accountability comes in. 
and of course it helps you with the consistent uh, flow of change so if you have a team of 20 people working in a sysadmin team and everybody's making changes all the time you can easily spot uh, those changes you can basically integrate and nicely have a flow of work um, another part of, uh, of uh, continuous delivery that I think it's important is a, it's a local environment for developers when you go on the development side um, so at ITV we use Vagrant um, for that side of things for anybody that's not familiar with Vagrant that's just a wrapper to put it mildly a wrapper around VirtualBox that allows you to spring up virtual machines whenever you need them <laughs> um, it provides a few providers that you can integrate with VirtualBox you can integrate with VMware and a few other community uh, supported providers like AWS and OpenStack and LXE so you can use it in a multitude of hypervisors and places um, why would you use such a thing if you think about it it's, it gives you a, a local environment for your developers um, why made up uh, or stood up with the same code that you stand up production that stand up um, test and dev and it gets you um, to have a shareable way of talking to the developers um, so basically they talk the same language as you you're not the only guy that knows and has the knowledge in your head of how your infrastructure works developers can just look at the puppet manifest and see how it works um, also it's a it's a completely destroyable environment right so if everybody somebody makes a mistake just destroys it brings it back up and most importantly it helps you get rid of that first thing works on my laptop syndrome where I'm sure everybody has hit this problem in, in their companies where developers just say well it works on my laptop I'm not sure what you've done in, in your other environment but enforcing a local environment for them it will make it so that everybody's working on the same baseline okay um, next uh, so source code management we use git at ITV and we use github for our central um, hosting why would you want to use a source code management well I think you can ask a developer next to you uh, out of curiosity how many developers and how many sysadmins in the room I think how many developers <laughs> just a few <laughs> close to nothing okay so next time when you go back to your office ask a developer why you should use <laughs> source code management I'm sure they had a lot of experience with this uh, but yeah I'll summarize a few things of why you should use um, source code management um, it gives you it gives you a bit of history on what has happened in a repository so keeping all your puppet code in a source code management allows you to go back in history to last month and see how was your infrastructure and how was your Apache configuration before and what you've changed if you need to do that um, <laughs> It helps you get rid of source code in a zip file and the next release is another zip file and you have no idea what changed in between them because it's a zip file. So again, it provides you accountability so you know who made the change and if you want to speak to them and find out why they made that change, you can go and speak to them and can go and sit down and work through if it was an error or understand what you've done um, so again it provides another bridge in between uh, developers and operations because they it's developers use uh, code in their source code management uh, operations use code in the source code management so it's a, it's a common language again um, another tool that we've been using at ITV which is a bit uh, more accustomed to our setup is that uh, once uh, create their 
their binaries, they push them to, a, to an artifactory uh, repository. Um, what is artifactory? It's just a binary repository. It, it versions binaries rather than code. And it's a few other things. It gives you proxies for your build tools. Um, why would you want to use it? Well, if you're a Java shop or Java-based shop, you would have a few um, tools that come with Artifactory that could help you. If you're not a Java shop, it won't. It won't really give you any benefit. Not very useful if you're Ruby shop, PHP, Python, or anything else. It, it helps us in our situation. So at this at this point, it's 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 sort of a um, Artifactory, sort of a more it's it's an ITV specific thing that we've introduced. You can you can do without it in your continuous delivery. It's not necessarily uh, for you if you're a Ruby or PHP shop. So now we're getting to the meaty part of a continuous delivery pipeline. So build your binaries once, right? What does that give you? That allows you to, to say that the binaries you've built and tested in a pre-production environment are the same that you deploy in production. So not building them again ensures that you haven't introduced any sort of anomaly when in your build tool. Um, so, and also brings the possibility of separating your your uh, your binaries from code from configuration. So you just use the the packaged binary in every environment, and you just switch configuration underneath it, ports and host names and whatnot. Um, I've kind of took this build your binaries once to to the next level that I could see useful for, for our organization and, and thought, well, if you just package your binaries once and you create a WAR file or a JAR file, why not package it for the operating system? Why not create an RPM? And then you can just deploy it consistently through an environment, test it. If, if that test passes, you move on. It's the same mentality, but do it with an operating system binary rather than with a, with a Java blob of things. Um, so this helps us because it gives us a kind of abstracts part of the deployment. Um, it abstracts a lot of the complication when you do a deployment pipeline. You don't need to care about where um, files go for an application. So you just package it in, in, in an RPM and your deployment tool becomes a lot more simpler because of it. Um, after you built the RPM, there's no additional tools that you will need to deploy it in, into a, your next environment. So it kind of moves away from, from those dependencies. Um, and the OS packaging gives you a lot of benefits. You can find out at any time with an, if you're using an orchestration tool what version of your application is running on your on your stage environment or on your production environment. Um, you can always find out if a file is part of that deployment that you thought it's not there, because that's part of the operating system package management. And you can easily roll back applications rather than um, rolling back directories or uh, I've seen it a few numbers done before. If it's an operating system package, you just make sure that you install the previous package version. So some tools that I've used to build this. So I was looking at a at, at tool for packaging things so, and building things. So I looked around a bit and I found that um, these are the best tools that we can use, Jenkins and Mock. And uh, I kind of thought, OK, how do you get your continuous building of these RPMs. I mean, there are a few tools out there. There's um, a Fedora Koji system that's a building system for Fedora. There's um, uh, the OpenSUSE build system, but I wasn't quite ready to invest that amount of time 
into learning how these tools work and I didn't really have that time. So I've just extracted the engine out of Fedora's Koji, just use mock and put it in Jenkins. And that just gives you a, a continuous build tool. Um, yeah, if you haven't seen people have actually done this, took an engine from Lamborghini and created a, another car for that engine. So I thought that's a nice metaphor for what I've done. So this gives us the, the power of the Koji build system, but without the learning curve of it. Um, right, this thing, run acceptance tests, right? This is more of a developer um, suited job and it's kind of their responsibility. It kind of ensures that the application you're running, it, it sticks to the standards that you want, it does what you think it does. And it's, um, it's a developer responsibility, but most of the time you have to be in a, a collaborative state with them because they don't, sometimes they don't understand how their application works on a system and they, they don't keep track of, um, of a lot of things. So you'd have to sit down and work with them. So we're getting to the point of how do you actually deploy. Um, when your application is already packaged, tested, you want to deploy it to an environment. All right. Historically, I've, I've seen it done, and I've done it with a few tools, like Rake and Capistrano. And some of these tools have a big disadvantage that I can see. And I don't really like that disadvantage. Where you have some steps that you tell your deployment uh, tool to do, you have to repeat them. Uh, and you also, the biggest disadvantage that I think, you have hard-coded servers in your deployment tool. So next time when you want to add another two or three or four deployment servers de uh, in your infrastructure, you have to go into the deployment tool, rewrite it, add these servers, check it in. So that introduces a, a lot of room for error. <coughs> and to be honest, I, I think it's uh, you could do it better. So what I've chosen to do is just use Capistrano as the <coughs> as the push command tool, and then rely on M Collective to do the actual um, orchestration on the infrastructure. Because from a deployment tool, all I want I want to tell my servers I the state they want them to be in, and I want the infrastructure to react to what I've asked it to do. Not, I don't want the, the deployment tool to be aware of what servers are where, what, which application goes onto what servers, and any of these things. I really don't want to do that. Um, so, how does this work, you think? Before you start your deployment in your configure config management tool in your puppet code, you tag those servers with factor facts and you tell it app X goes on those servers, app Y goes on the other servers. Um, so then you create bundles of servers for a specific purpose. Um, and then you just use M Collective as an orchestration tool. So from your Capistrano tools, you say deploy version one of app X. Capistrano talks to M Collective and says deploy version one of uh, app X. M Collective knows where ser which servers Apex relies on, and it has the steps that it needs to do. It, it gets them from Capistrano, so it just goes and deploys where you need. So it gets, this gets you to, into a nice point where you've built your, your application, you've tested it, and then you can deploy it seamlessly without you needing to think, oh, which environment is this? Have I added any servers? Have I removed any servers? Have I forgot anything? You've already done that in your puppet code. It's, it's been done already, so there's no point in duplicating this work. Uh, a good thing about um, M Collective is that in the latest versions, it has um, JSON responses, so it's it's nice. You can integrate with it nicely. Or with a programming language, just parse that JSON and you got the responses back of what you want. Um, before, uh, uh, a few years before, it had no JSON uh, output, so it was a bit hard to parse 
the output that it gives. So yeah, you, you can ask it things, but when it comes to the response, it's a bit weird to parse it. Um, these days, it's quite easy to work with, and it comes with it comes with Puppet in the same bundle they they support it. So it's basically another tool that comes in the Puppet ecosystem. So it was easy to just put it in. Other continuous deployment practices that we have at the moment is just this. It's valid for our production environment for now. It's where evolving the continuous uh, deployment pipeline. So for now, this stands. In the future, this will go away. There's no point if it doesn't matter which day you're deploying. Um, as long as you've tested everything and ev your tests are green, just go and deploy it. For now, we, we kind of need this in place. But as we're de evolving, we'll remove the need for a not deploy on a Friday. So I kind of rattled through this a bit. I've gone to the end of my talk. Um, shall we go to questions? How does, uh, you mentioned Mock earlier. Uh, what, 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 I'm not familiar with that. So what, how does that work within Jenkins? Mock. Yeah. Uh, Mock is a um, RPM build tool. So it, it helps you build RPMs in a Chirut jail. So basically you give it uh, an SRPM and it'll do the job of uh, spinning up um, a, a Chirut job, a Chirut jail with a, with a full binaries inside and it'll just get all uh, that up and running, builds your RPM and then it removes the, the Chirut. So every time you build your RPM, it's in a clean environment. So basically Jenkins is just um, Jenkins master to a Jenkins slave that has this in, in its guts, in its interior. Builds your RPM and then spits it out. So you still have to uh, write the, uh, the spec file? You, yeah, you still have to write the spec file. But to be honest, that's not something that you write that much. You just write it once and you're done. Um, when your application progresses into new versions and new things, you just um, make it a, you make your spec a, a template and you just remove the things that, or replace version numbers and things like that. So you don't need to rewrite it again. You have a microphone next to you. You ended up with a combination of um, Capistrano and M Collective. Yeah. I was wondering, did you evaluate anything like Fabric or Ansible before you went with that? Ansible. Uh, yeah. So, I've looked at Fabric. Yeah. Right, and I looked at Capistrano. They're kind of the same tool in the same space. Um, yeah, it's kind of similar. If you'd gone with, say, Fabric, you could have eliminated the M Collective because you can push everything out in parallel with Fabric. Right. Um, uh, and you could have eliminated a bunch of ex additional daemons and message queue system then. Okay, I haven't looked at Fabric at all. Okay. Uh, well, I've looked Are at Fabric, but <laughs> um, maybe I'm mistaking it. Are you not talking about Funk or Fabric? Which one is... Mm, fabric, I thought it's, it's just... Uh, by the brief looking at their website, I thought it was just a, um, a small wrapper like Capistrano, just a push config tool. Um, no, Fabric's a bit more elaborate than that. It's a Python-based tool, but um, you can kind of write all your own modules. And the other problem you um, mentioned earlier, where you have to end up hard coding host names into the yeah, yeah, config. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what we've actually done is we've built um, some uh, APIs to interface with our CMDB, which pull all the host names out of that, feed them into Fabric, um, so you, you get rid of that problem that way. Okay, so it's, it's a different approach. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I take those server names out of Puppet. So you've already done that job of creating configuration management for them, so use yeah. it with them collective. But yeah, we tend approach. to use the Puppet on the actual platform um, deployment stuff for the application deployment, we, we use this fabric type mechanism, uh, which queries CMDB, um, does all kinds of stuff with load balancers, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, all that. Interesting approach. Okay. <laughs> Could you say a bit more why you moved from um, Red Hat to CentOS? 
Sorry, could you say a bit more why you moved from Red Hat to CentOS? So, historically, using Red Hat, we never had to call them. We never had to um, get any support for them. Um, so, for us, it didn't really make any sense in going with Red Hat. Also, it, it, it hampers things like um, you're not... Uh, you have to, for example, it comes down to, to uh, licenses, right? How do you go about creating a Vagram virtual machine with a Red Hat uh, license that you can distribute to everybody else? Is it, is that, cause it, does that go into a Red Hat 1 license? Does, do you need a license per machine? How does that work? Um, then again, uh, another thing is um, a, a personal thing that annoyed me about Red Hat is their, um, their repositories. If you install things too fast, the repositories kick you out because it says you're spamming their network. Um, so that's another thing. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Uh, when you're deploying your application software, are you deploying this onto existing uh, production servers that you have set up already, or are you re-kickstarting a server, or deploying to a private cloud, or anything like that? Uh, it's, it's a virtualized environment. Okay. So for the moment, those virtual machines are kind of static in a pre-prod environment, but we're looking at uh, kickstarting them okay. and rebuilding them. How do, you, how do you ensure that the environment is uh, clean? For example, you're building your RPM dependencies in Mark and your application in Mark. But the server that you deploy that to, how are you making sure that server is consistent across all of the application servers, as in all the software on each? So each. that's that's Puppet's job. Mm -hmm. Puppet will keep those servers consistent, the way you've described them. Anyone else? Everybody's good, okay. <laughs>